this is uh, Super Day, our Super Bowl Sunday, so we thought, hey, let's do something special with it, right? So we're excited about that. Um, you guys can start taking the offering. We're going to take the offering now. And so we're going to be doing a uh, special event. We have some special uh, guests with us, uh, John Jacobs, his team. And uh, we'll be doing a, a, uh, an additional offering that we don't normally do, but we're going to be doing that today. Uh, it's going to be a love offering to help ex the expenses of, of, of this trip, but also the ministry that they, that they do. And, th and John will tell you a little bit about that in just a moment. As, uh, as they take the offering, I want to just go ahead and uh, introduce John. He's uh, uh, our, our going to be our, uh, doing the, the demonstration team and what they share. And so here's, uh, here's a little bit about John for those of you who don't know. John Jacobs is the founder of the Strength Evangelistic Concept and Power Team, now called Next Generation Power Force. He has held over 3,000 crusades in 40 countries, from a bullfighting ring in Venezuela to record numbers in Moscow, Russia. His team also has also held over 30,000 public school assemblies in the U.S. alone, where he frequented many of the world's largest churches, like the Potter's House with T.D. Jakes and Lakewood Church uh, with Joel Olstein. He has been featured on CNN, People Magazine, and almost every major network. In the past, John has a, had a worldwide weekly television show that ran for 15 years. 15 years ago, Chuck Norris attended one of John's crusades where he accepted Christ. As a result, CBS did an entire episode of Walker, Te Texas Ranger, featuring John and his team. Since John began the min his ministry, uh, he has seen over a million people come to know Christ in his crusades. Isn't that awesome? The last thing and most important, John has passion for seeing the lost saved, the brokenhearted healed, the depressed encouraged, and Christ getting all the credit. Last night we saw an amazing number of people uh, give their life to Christ, and uh, and we're excited. We know that God's going to do something powerful today. You are not here by accident. Even though somebody may have invited you or maybe you saw the sign or the Internet, we, God has you here to share a powerful message. And uh, John's going to help communicate that. Would you give him a warm welcome? Thank you. Power is Virginia people. How many know... Virginia people are just bad to the bone. Amen? Um, and I, have, I go to churches all over the world, especially now in America and, and not so much internationally in the last few years. But this church has blown me away. I just want to tell you what my opinion is of this church. Pastor Sharon and Pastor Andy, Pastor Andy has one of the biggest hearts I've ever met, one of the most Christ-like kind. Pastor Andy, you're honestly... People don't realize you're one of the most Christ-like, biggest-hearted pastors I've ever met. I'm not joking. And Pastor Sharon and his wife. And then the people in this church are just so friendly and warm. And that praise and worship leader, I, it's as good, that's as good as it gets in any church in America. So why wouldn't you go to church here if you lived it within... 30 miles of here. This is awesome. You know, in these last days, I believe God is raising up key churches. I call them hero churches in, in these last days. And I believe God's up to something big. I'm believing in Jesus' name that this church in this next year, I would, was praying this morning, and I believe in this next year, this church is going to double in size. How many will agree with me in Jesus' name? This is your season. Everybody say, this is our season. And we will bear fruit in Jesus' name. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know some of you wonder on Sunday morning, we don't normally break things and bend things, but we want to get some people who don't normally come to church. And how many of you know this is an outreach to reach people? And we go into schools uh, every, almost every day from Bangor, Maine to Kodiak Island, Alaska. We go into little kids' schools, middle schools, high schools, and if we just wore our warm-ups, how many know they wouldn't listen to us? But if we press a log and we break handcuffs and bend bars and snap bats over our head, the, the whole school respects that, and they listen. And we pray for the anointing. God send the Holy Spirit. God send angels before the kids come in there. And we put a message of hope. 
to the little kids. We talk about you can overcome your scars. This world needs you. We talk about respect for authority. We talk about respecting each other. We talk about being a hero versus a bully zero. You know, one out of four kids is bullied in America. And did you know the little kids cheer for themselves? And then we talk to the high school kids about being a dream maker versus a dream breaker. We talk about um, how to pull together, the power of pulling together and respecting each other. And then we say, come back tonight at so-and-so church and bring your moms and dads. And you'll see this, this, and this, and much more. They come by the hundreds. And in every school we go to, we average five kids saying, thanks for what you said. I'm not going to take my life now. And we average ten kids saying, I'm not going to cut myself anymore. And you know what? God has given us a tool to get to where they are. And half of them don't go to church. And half of them don't have parents like you. And half of them don't get one word of encouragement at home. And I want to say thank God for this church that you are creative. It's not just church as usual. That this is a creative church to win people, to get new names in heaven. So I'm going to tell you, I'm proud of this church. And I love this church, and I love you, Pastor. Fasten your seatbelts. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And if God is for you, who can be against you? It's power time. I have five members of my team, and I've got the, I brought the two biggest, the one, two that played pro football just because it's Super Bowl. First of all, Sean King played six years. He was the first defensive lineman ever drafted by the Carolina Panthers. He played six years for the Carolina Panthers and one year for the Indianapolis Colts with Peyton Manning. He stands six foot six, 300 pounds. Sean King. Come on, Sean. Power. Everybody say power. Now, power is his six-year younger brother that is 60 pounds bigger and played two years for the Chicago Bears and was an All-American in college. Growing up, their parents told me the reason they got so big, oh, Sean's, Sean's son is 15 and is bigger, much bigger than Sean is. He's a, he's a freshman in high school. They drank a gallon of milk apiece every day. Kids, drink your milk. And I'm not joking. Ladies and gentlemen, his younger brother, six foot seven, almost 400 pounds, Jerome King. Come on, Jerome. You've seen me break baseball bats before, Pastor. I mean, the first time we ever tried to break a bat was 25 years ago. The only two out of seven of us could snap a bat. Then there came a guy who could snap two bats. Sean was the first man to ever snap three. But I never dreamed there'd ever be a man that would snap baseball bats over his bare head. Bo Jackson did it with a helmet. But Jerome's going to do it with no helmet. And then we have a bar here that's almost an inch around, a jail cell bar. They're going to bend that over their head with brute strength. They're some of the strongest. Sean's grip has been measured at 4,000 pounds per square inch. And we have a phone book. Now, you've seen me rip phone books, Pastor. And, I mean, that's been one of the strong men feats, ripping phone books. But Jerome doesn't rip them with his hands. Yeah, sure. He rips them with his teeth. No, and he, you know what else he does? We're going to rip two license plates. But he doesn't rip them with his hands. He bites through them. You want to see how sharp his teeth are? Go ahead. This is a soft drink can. Watch him take a bite out of it. Spit it out. Okay. And uh, how many know those are some sharp teeth? Other piece. We have uh, two baseball bats. Um, Sean is going to try to snap the two bats at once. Then I have a hammer. This hammer is from Home Depot. And Sean is going to use his 4,000-pound grip to snap a hammer. And we have these two giant picks. And Sean holds them on the end. His wrists are so strong, he lowers them to his eyes and raises them out. First time he did this, he could only do it six times. T today, for pastor, for an all-time 
ever, first time world record, 40 times without dropping them into his eyes. And then at the end, then at the end, we're going to snap a pair of handcuffs. Uh, and then guess what? We're, you know what we're going to do in the second service? A lot of you want to come back for this because we're going to, one of the things that Jerome does, well, look how big Jerome's hand is. He, he can squeeze a soft drink can until it explodes. Then he starts smashing them flat over his head. He's almost knocked himself out. But in the 11 o'clock service, guess what we're going to do? If it's packed out, it's the biggest crowd ever at 11 o'clock. Jerome is going to run across the stage, jump through the air, and crush this unopened can over the pastor's head, Pastor Andy's head. For souls. Let's go, quickly. What? So, ladies and gentlemen, hey, we may be big, but we don't think we're the big stuff. Jesus is the big stuff. And don't be nervous. It's okay to have fun in church. And are you, are you ready? I know some of you thought, well, I never thought I'd see that in church. But you know what? There may be some people sitting here. You never thought you'd see them in church. How many of you know that's what this is all about? Are you ready? Everybody say, come on, Jerome. Five, four, three, two, one. Come on. This is a carriage bolt that holds railroad ties together. He's not going to just bend it. He's going to snap it. Come on, Sean. Help him out. Come on. Use your grip. You, come on, help him. Help him. Help him. Now, bending an inch of steel over his head. Use all your strength. All your strength. Five, four, three, two, one. Come on, help him. Come on, help him, help him, help him. Now, snapping two baseball bats at the same time. The, the Louisville Slugger Company said nobody. They, a few years ago, they said nobody could snap two bats by just pressing them. But you got to believe, you and God can do anything together. Come on, help him out. Now, we, we have three Virginia frying pans. He's going to use his giant hand, roll them up like a burrito. Come on. Come on. Help him. Come on, somebody in the back, help him. Everybody say, you can chew it. Some of the sharpest teeth and the strongest teeth in the world. Come on. Come on, Jerome. Chew. Bite. 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 Keep it together. Now, two Virginia license plates. He's chewing through. Come on. Chew, bite, bite. Now, get some water. Uh, I have here a hammer, and this hammer, when he tries to snap it, is indestructible. They said that um, these hammers, because of the fiberglass, it takes over 2,000 pounds per square inch to try to snap one of these. And this is so hard, we failed on one of these four weeks in a row. And so I don't want them just to do this to say, hey, we did it. I want to dedicate this to anybody in this crowd that's going through a tough time. Because this is a tough hammer. And I want to dedicate this effort to you as a message 
The tough times don't last. Tough people do. I want to dedicate this as a message. Psalms chapter 3 says, Many are they that rise up against me. Many are they that say, There's no hope for you in God. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. And today, if you're going through something, you came here this morning and you feel like the odds are against you, let me tell you, God can make up 50 years in five minutes. God wants to restore and recover all. He wants to redeem the time you've lost. God loves to turn setback stories into comeback stories. I'm serious. How many of you have ever had a setback? I want you to claim that God's going to give you a comeback story in 2000. Everybody say in 2016. God's going to give me comeback stories. And I want you to do this for everyone here that's had a setback, that's going through a tough time, and then I want you to share your testimony. Because Sean's family was on the, on the ropes. It didn't look good. His father was a raging alcoholic. His two-year-old son in the middle of the NFL while he was playing had, got, had a heart attack and, and from pneumonia and was put on life support. And they said that he's not going to make it. But it's not over until Jesus says it's over. And God did a miracle to save their whole family. And in the 11 o'clock service, can you share that? Because we're going to pray for miracles in the 11 o'clock service. Then I'm going to pray that what God did for your son, God can do for anybody here. How many know God is a God of miracles? But when you snap this hammer, and then Jerome, I want you to share a few words. And uh, this is for anyone here that's been going through a tough time. You've been discouraged. God will never give up on you. He's bigger than any mistake you've ever made. How many are glad God's forgiveness is fresh every morning? Great is his faithfulness. Come on. Everybody say, come on, Sean. Sean. Come on, Sean. Woo. Hey, praise the Lord. Let's give Jesus one big hand clap for this Sunday morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share one scripture this morning. One scripture from the Bible, and it comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and to always be ready. Everybody say, be ready. To give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I'll say it one more time. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and to always be ready. To give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, ladies and gentlemen, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And the word sanctify means to acknowledge or to set apart time for the Lord in your heart. Not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday night prayer meeting, not just on Friday night youth group, but each and every day we should set apart time for the Lord God in our heart. You see, God wants a relationship with us each and every day. But that's not the part of the verse that I want to focus on this morning because it goes on to say, and to always be ready. Everybody say, be ready. To give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this morning what I want to focus on is hope. You see, I believe that a lot of people, not just in the church but in general, struggle with hope. You know why I believe that? Because the Bible declares that hope deferred makes the heart sick. How many of you out here have ever put your hope into something in this world and been let down? I'm sure at some point each and every person in this room has put your hope into this world and been let down. But this morning I want to tell you why there's hope in me. This morning I want to tell you why I have something that the world doesn't have. You see, if you're a believer in this building, there has to be something different about you. And people want to know what it is. You see, we do hundreds and hundreds of school assemblies each and every year all across the United States. From elementary schools to high schools. And when we go into an elementary school, first through fifth grade, and we ask the young elementary students, do you have a hope? What's your dream? You'll see 100% of the elementary students' hands that go up. 
I mean, literally, a kid will tote you out of the building if you don't pick them so they can tell you what they want to be when they get a little bit older. But as we make our way to middle schools and junior highs all across the United States, and we ask the young middle school students, do you have a hope? What's your dream inside your heart? You'll be lucky if you get 60% of the elementary students' hands to go up. I mean, the middle school students. And as we make our way to high schools all across the United States, from Bangor, Maine, to Kodiak Island, Alaska, and we ask the young adults, do you have a hope? What's your dream inside your heart? You'll be lucky if you get 30% of the high school students' hands to go up. And you know what that tells us? That tells us that somewhere in between elementary school and high school, kids today are struggling with hope. Come on, how many of you believe that? Kids today are struggling with hope. All you have to do is turn on your television, read your newspaper. Kids today are struggling with hope. You know, one of the leading secular bands that came out a couple of years ago named Slipknot, you know what the name of the album was called? All hope is gone. That was the message that's being sent to the kids today. All hope is gone. But I stand here today and I tell you that all hope is not gone because my Bible declares in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, that you are of God's little children and have overcome the world because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. You know, we go to the elementary schools, first through fifth grade, and we ask the young elementary students, what do you want to be with your life? I want to be the next NFL football player. I want to be the next Major League Baseball star. I want to be the next WWE wrestler. But come to find out not too long ago, one of the top wrestlers, Chris Benoit, man, he had all the money, he had a beautiful home, a beautiful house on the hill, a beautiful wife. In the world's estimation, he had it going on. But come to find out, he choked his wife and he killed her. He choked his son and he killed him. And then he hung himself. And you know what? For the life of me this morning, I can't find any hope in that situation. You know, not too long ago, there was a, a teen thrill kill up in Detroit, Michigan. A 16-year-old boy, him and five of his buddies, they decapitated a man's head. And the reason I tell you this this morning is because as I saw them, as I looked at their face, it's like they didn't even show any emotion. It's like they weren't even feeling anything. And you know what? I can't find any hope in that situation either. But I want to tell you why there's hope in me. I want to tell you why I have something that the world doesn't have. You see, if you're a believer in this building, there had to be something different about you. You know, I grew up with big hopes and big dreams in a town called West Monroe, Louisiana. You know, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be as a little boy, I would have told you I wanted to be in the NFL or the NBA. But I grew up in a town that struggled with hope. You know, nobody ever made it to the NFL. The people we looked up to were gangbangers and drug dealers. You know, I grew up with another obstacle. Our dad was an alcoholic. We used to watch him being on our mom. We looked for love in all the wrong places. But you know what? We had one praying person in our home, and it was our mom. My mom prayed every day that we would all come to know the Lord. But you know what? I lived my life how I wanted to live it. You know, I remember my brother making it to the, to the NFL when I was 15 years old. Man, here it is. I have all the money. I have everything that this world says it takes for me to be successful. I thought that I could do everything on my own. But there came a point in my life where Jerome King wasn't smart enough. There came a point in my life where I wasn't strong enough. There came a point in my life where I had to surrender my life to an almighty God and ask him to come inside and save me. And I remember watching my dad give his heart to Jesus. You see, my dad would say, hey, I'll start coming to church after I stop drinking, or I'll stop doing this, and then I'll come to church. But how many of you understand it doesn't work like that? How many of you know you have to give your problems to God, and when God owns you, then God can clean you up? You can never clean up yourself. Good luck with that. That's like cleaning a fish before you catch it. You have to let Jesus catch you, and then Jesus can clean you up. And I watched God clean my dad up. So I knew that the power of God was real. Nobody could tell me any differently. But I struggled with hope still. And I watched my brother give his heart to Jesus. But you know what? I still struggle with things. I was trying to play football. I was getting released from the NFL. I was playing arena football. I was trying to hang on to the material things of the world that it said it takes for me to be successful. And I remember as I was losing things, as I moved back home to my old neighborhood with all my old buddies that struggled with hope also. And I remember a friend, he invited me to a church service one night. He said, hey, Jerome, excuse me. If you'll come to this meeting tonight, it'll change your life. And I had never given anybody a chance to change my life. I always thought that I could change myself. But that night I gave it a chance. 
that night I was really searching for something. And I remember as I sat in the back pews, as I lit, began to listen, he was speaking on who Jesus is and what he can do in my life. And then he told me how he died this horrible Roman crucifixion so that I could have life for all of eternity. You know, I started thinking about my life, the people I've hurt, the decisions I've made, the choices I've made, and I wondered, man, how could anybody give their life for Jerome King? But that night he told me how much he loved me. You see, I've been to church my whole life. I was on the worship team. I was on the usher board. I knew all the stories of the Bible. I knew how to pray for people. But I didn't have a relationship with God. I thought God wanted to get me. I thought that God was mad at me and I needed a scorecard to earn my way into heaven and my scorecard could never be good enough. But the Bible declared that we're saved by grace and that night his grace was upon me. That night God began to reveal himself to me. You see, the Bible declares that our lives are hid with Christ, that if you lose your life to Christ, you'll find your life. But if you try to hang on to it, you're going to lose it. And that night, I gave my life to Christ, and I humbled myself. And the Bible declares that if you'll humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hands of God, he will exalt you, or he will lift you up. And the reason for the hope that is in me tonight is because that night, God saved me. He set me free. He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life, and I no, no matter what happens from this moment forth, God Almighty has my back. Thank you guys for listening. Sean's going to go for a new record. Are you feeling strong this morning? Here we go. When he first did this, he could only do it six or seven times. These things weigh about nine or ten pounds apiece. Lowers them to his eyes. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Come on, twenty one, twenty two. 23, 24, come on, help him, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, come on, further than ever before, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, come on, 8, 39, 4, You know, ladies and gentlemen, there are over 2 million churches in North America, but not one minister can go into America's schools. I've been doing this for 30 years, but I've never seen the spiritual warfare against America's kids like today. You know, I've been in the ministry for over 30 years, and all my, all my life, as a Christian, people preached these are the last days Jesus is coming back. But We've never seen what we're seeing now. Folks, we are in the last days when our country makes a covenant with another country's whole purpose to destroy Israel. You're in the last days. When you see Target take down the signs for boys and girls and say, we'll no longer call them boys and girls. They're whatever they want to be. And the transgender programs are telling the kids, you can be whatever. You don't have to be a boy or a girl. How I many you know what they're trying to steal, the devil's trying to steal the identity and the conscience of America's kids. In the 1980s and 90s, teen suicide was a crisis. Then it was teen thrill kill. We were just in one school in Chicago. Five kids decapitated a homeless man. Do you see where the two, three girls took a mentally handicapped boy out of the ice and put his head under the ice and didn't, didn't even show sor sorrow? But I want to tell you, you know what happened last year? Twelve senior citizens were killed in America because junior high kids dared each other to go sucker punch them in the face. How many of you understand, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the devil knows his time is short and he is going to unloose hell 
in those last days. And I want to tell you, God is looking for heroes and hero churches. And the Bible says he's raising up people to show his favor on what he can do in these last days. And I want to tell you, you've, there's never been a more important time to be alive for the kingdom of God. You've been born for such a time as this. And how many understand God's put you here to, more than to take up space and breathe oxygen? God's put you here to make a difference. Come on. And t today, today, we're going to, in the next few weeks, the schools we're going to are very, very important. In South Carolina, North Carolina, Louisiana, and it's not easy because each school we go to costs us $1,000. And for 18 years, we charged the schools. How many of you know we have eight staff people? We have five members of our team. Sometimes we do 20 schools in a week. And for 18 years, we had to charge the schools $1,000. But you know what broke my heart? Let me ask you good Virginia people. If you understand. Half the schools couldn't afford it. How many of you know the ones that need it the most couldn't afford it? We had to drive by the Bob wire fence schools. And you know what? We came to a school district in Texas, and they said, we don't even have gas money for the buses. We can't have you. And the Lord spoke to me. You're doing this the wrong way. This is the number one mission field. Jesus said, first, go to your own Jerusalem. Then go to the uttermost parts of the world. And you know what we did? We took up an offering, passed out an envelope to every person. And I asked every good person in that town, like every one of you awesome Virginia people, to take out their checkbook, take out their billfold, and to give to the Lord and go with us to the schools. And you know what? That day changed everything. It's been 16 years now, and we have not charged one school since. Now we get to go to the, you know why? Because when people give to God, they move things in the spirit. How many of you know Jesus said one can put 1,000 in flight, two can put 10,000? How many of you know there's enough pulling power in this building right now? If we all pull together, we can pull whole cities back for God. Come on, somebody. And today... Can everybody see this envelope? And ushers, don't move yet. In a moment, everybody in here is going to receive this envelope. And I'm going to ask you in the back and the front, I'm going to ask every mom and dad, every businessman and businesswoman to take out your checkbook. First of all, don't get nervous. Nobody has ever been hurt from giving to God. How many of you know, second of all, how many of you can't outgive the Lord? How many of you know what's given to God can never be a loss? How many of you know it's always a gain? And then this morning, when you receive this envelope, we have to believe God this weekend. For the t we have 10 schools in the next two weeks that aren't sponsored. And I've been praying the last five days, Lord, raise up this church to be a, a surprise hero church. Lord, let this church stand in the gap for those 10,000 kids. And I'm going to ask you this morning, when you receive this envelope, I want to ask you to pray over it. Because Jesus said what you've done to the little ones, you've done directly to me. When you pull for a child... How many of you know you pull God's attention right into your life? How many of you understand that? And this morning, when you receive this envelope, I'm going to ask you, if you don't have any money to give, just ask the person next to you to give you some. I'm going to ask you to take out your checkbook and listen. We were at a church the other day, four school teachers. Each one wrote a check for $1,000 and sponsored a school. And I looked at that and I said, how could they do that? They don't make enough money. They're school teachers. They, they need to... And the Lord told me, don't worry about them. That's not my way of getting money from them. That's my way of getting money to them. Hey, you know what? Last year, Pastor, we had two homeless people sponsor a school. I had a lady in the front row. She had a little baby. And she goes, I want, she put 10 $100 bills in an envelope. She goes, I want to sponsor a school in the name of my baby because the father will never support it. And she goes, by the way, I'm homeless. And I, pr I, 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 didn't know what to do. I, I just prayed over, God, honor her seed. Lord, honor the, Lord, I know this has your attention. Two weeks later, she called our office. Someone had given her a house worth $145,000. How many of you believe when you, when you pull for, and how many of you in this crowd today are believing God for, how many of you want a divine surprise in 2016? How many of you want God to come through for you? Let me see. How many of you still believe in God for something, for your family, your finances? 
I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're going to do this. I believe this morning, how many think God could, we could see all 10 schools come in this service. How many know that would make me the happiest man in Virginia? Come on, somebody. When you receive this envelope, I see a lot of you good-looking grandparents. How many grandparents do we have here? Grandparents, you're heroes. You're awesome. You know why I love grandparents so much? Listen, because when my dad left me when I was seven, and my mom and I were estranged, guess who took me in? Guess who raised me? Guess who my best friends that cooked for me, bought me my clothes, took me to church three times a week? My best friends who raised me were my grandparents, and they taught me how to live by faith. I killed my first squirrel when I was nine years old with my grandpa's shotgun. He cleaned it. My grandma cooked it. How many know I can tell that in Virginia? Come on, somebody. <laughs> but you know what? My grandparents, they died. My grandparents died 18 years ago, and you know what I inherited? 800 acres of swampland. Now, how many of you know it's great to inherit 800 acres? But if it's swampland, then it's not worth anything because it floods three times a year. But not long after that, I found out about a pastor of a church whose son could die. And he didn't have money enough to have to save his son's life. And the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and said, go to the bank in the morning, take out your savings, and send it all to help save that pastor's son's life. I said, Lord, I've never done that. And the Lord spoke to me, if you want to see what you've never seen, you got to do what you've never done. How many in here want to see what you've never seen in 2016? Come on. Then what do you got to do? Do what you've never done. I took out my $10,000 savings, and I sent it to help save that pastor's son's life. Six months later, I got a phone call from the Department of Wildlife, Fish, and Game Environment. You know who it is? It's the officer from the Wildlife, Fish, and Environment. And he said, Mr. Jacobs, is this your land? I said, yes. He said, your land just became some of the most valuable land in the world. I said, come on, in the world? He said, no, in the world. And then I perked up. I said, is it oil, gas, or coal? And he said, it's more valuable than oil, gas, or coal. And I said, well, what is it? He said, for some reason, in the last few months, we discovered 400 giant ferns, plants, that are prehistoric and extinct. And any time we find an extinct animal or extinct plant, we have to buy that land as an international sanctuary, and we have to protect whatever is extinct. It confused me. I thought it was no big deal. I forgot about it. But two months later, I received all these documents and this big thing in the mail, and in it was a check, a check with my name on it. 200 times 10,000. 200 times 10,000. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? That left heaven the moment you pulled for that child, and there was nothing the devil could do to stop it. How many of you this morning want something to leave heaven for your life in 2016? How many of you believe when you pull for these kids, we just got one young man pulled a gun out of his pocket, handed it to him, and said, I was going to kill myself in class, but now I'm not. Two girls said, thanks, John Jacobs, three months ago in West Virginia, we were going to cut our wrist tonight, and my mom showed me how to do it. You don't cut across, you cut down, and now we're not. Both of them showed up that night at the church with their mom, and they got saved. How many of you believe this is God's business? I said, how many of you know when you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business? Come on. And this morning, when the ushers hand you this envelope, you know I'm going to pray. If God can grow up extinct plants on my swampland, how many of you believe God can find a way to do it for you? Come on, somebody. And I'm going to ask the ushers to pass out an envelope to everybody here. You know, I'm, I'm asking God for five people this morning to give a, a, a sponsor a school. I've been praying. I prayed last night. I'm believing for five bu businessmen, grandparents, school teacher, one 17-year-old girl. She sponsored a school with a $1,000 check, and she had no hair. She was bald. She goes, I'm going to sponsor a school out of my cancer fund. I have leukemia. I'm going to ask you to plant a seed in God's hand this morning. How many believe we could see all 10 schools come in this service right here? Come on. We don't charge the church. We pay our own airfare to every school. Everybody say 10 schools. I want you to hold that envelope in your hand. I want you to pray over it. One more time. How many of you want a divine surprise in 2016? How many of you want to see a new season of God's favor? 
Well, then this morning, I want you to make a covenant with God. I want you to hold that envelope, and I want you to pray over it. I want everybody here to give, I want you to do something you'll remember. Do something that moves you. I'm praying for, I believe, you know what, January 1st, God told me to be somebody coming that would sponsor five schools. I prayed last night, Lord, let that person be there in the morning. How many of you believe this church is going to surprise me? How many of you think this is not an ordinary Virginia church? How many believe this is an America-changing church? Come on, somebody. All right, hold that envelope in your hand. Hold your checkbook in your hand. Hold your billfold. Hold something. I want you to pray over it and make this a holy offering. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Heavenly Father, I pray the favor. I pray the season of comebacks. Lord, I pray as these people pull for these kids who don't have anyone, I pray you would pull for them in 2016. Lord, what you did for me, I pray you'll find a way to do for them. That a divine, so I announce a divine surprise that just won't pay their bills, but will change the rest of their life. Now everybody say, everyone say, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. What would you have me give? Now just wait a moment. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to everyone here. I believe God's speaking to those five people. He put in my heart to sponsor a school. I promise you, you'll never be the same again. I believe that person is going to be here that's going to sponsor five schools. I've been praying for it since January 1st, the prayer of Jabez over their life. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to everyone here. Thank you for this generous church and this generous pastor and his wife. In Jesus' name, And everybody said, if you're making a check this morning, just make your check to John Jacobs Power Force. Ushers, can you run pens forward real quick? If you need a pen, ushers, and, and um, can, you, can you bring the pens? If you need a pen, just raise your hand. Um, would, and if you're making a check, if you, if you don't have a, a lot of folks don't carry checkbooks, so any card will work. I don't carry a checkbook. And so any, any card, if you fill out the back, you can use any card, and we do shred them after we run them. We send you a thank you card. So everybody fill out your envelope real quick. Everybody say 10 schools. Come on. Everybody say 10 schools. How many believe this is one of those hero churches? How many think God's calling for heroes? Come on. Everybody fill out your envelope. Make your, Again, if you, any card will work, just fill it out. You'll have time right now. And then close the envelope in just a couple minutes. But before, while they're closing their envelopes, I want you to crush the... In the 11 o'clock service, it's going to be a little different. Sean's going to share his testimony. And you're going to crush a can over a pastor's head. No music. Well, while you're filling out your envelopes and writing your checks, I want you, can you crush one over your own head? So pastor, can, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Go on. Oh, my Lord. Are you bleeding? Are you hurt? Now, how many of you want to see him do that over a pastor's head? Somebody say, oh, my. How many think the 11 o'clock service maybe had the biggest crowd history? Come on. How many know people? There's some people in this town that are trying to get him canned for years. Everybody got the envelope ready? How many know we're going to give the devil a whipping? Everybody say 10 schools. Okay, ushers, can you come forward and begin to pass? Everybody just put your envelope in the bucket when it comes by. Now we're coming to the very end. And Sean is going to try to snap a pair of police handcuffs. And I just want to ask, is there anybody in this crowd that knows who's been trained professionally? Ushers, people are still writing, so give them just a minute to finish writing. Is there anybody here that's been trained um, in putting security guard, policeman, deputy sheriff, MP? Um, um, okay, we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll where? We got a Marine right here? What? Okay. Now, and, and I'm going to have them handcuff you. I'm going to have them handcuff you and take you to the side room. And I'm going to call you right back in. We're going to snap the chains. We're going to close in prayer. And I'm going I'm to close with a scripture. But I want you to pull. He'll have to pull with everything he has. But how many think you're not here by accident this morning? How many know heaven's pulling for you? Come on. C come on up here. Just jump. Just jump. Pick him up. Give us your, <laughs> give us your name. David Groblin. David Knight. How do you know handcuffs? 
I used to be a former police officer and a counter nar counter narcotics division in the military. Really? Well, thank you for your service and God bless you. Would you mind taking him to that side room and locking three clicks, three clicks on each on each one? And uh, now we're down to the last few minutes. Pastor, I've been really nervous about the 11 o'clock service. I couldn't even eat breakfast this morning. I was, Lord, I said, people came up to me, please pray for our pastor. You won't hurt him. I had a pastor say, what does it feel like? I said, like a bee sting. And then he said, a bumblebee sting right between the eyes. But I want to close with one scripture from the Bible. And I want you to put it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness. For them that are perishing, going to hell, don't know God. But for us who are saved by it, it's the power of God. Now listen to me closely. There are 8,000 religions in the world. You know what separates us from the other 8,000 religions? Is on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And the Bible says, when you call on his name, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes to live inside your heart. It's a miracle and a mystery. And the Bible says it, there's only one way to the Father. One way, and that's through Jesus. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the cross. But it's not a religion. I'm of the Christian faith. It's not about of the Christian faith. It's a question is, the spirit of Jesus alive in your heart. I want you to know that the power of God is what separates us from every other religion. I had a friend that owned a movie theater, and he told me last year they had the second scariest movie since The Exorcist. He said, we had to take four people to the hospital because they hyperventilated. <laughs> And he said, it was a, it's a true movie. It's, it's based on a true story about these demons that came in and this, lived in this house. And his family moved in. And the demons came into the mother. And she tried to kill the father, kill the children. And nothing they did could kick the devil and the demons out of the house. Until finally a minister came, used the Bible in the name of Jesus. And finally... He kicked the demons out of the house, and the family got set free. At the end of the movie, they said, evil is real, but so is the power of God. And you know what? Two weeks later, I was having dinner in New York, and the waitress said, that house is two blocks from where I live. And you know what hit me? And I said to her, it's a good thing we have the power of God in case the devil comes to your house. My point being tonight is, it's not a religion that will kick the devil out of the house. How many of you know it's the power of Jesus? It's the power of God. I was born in New Orleans. I grew up as a little kid in New Orleans. And when I grew up in New Orleans in the late 1960s, how many of you know it wasn't an easy place to grow up? I, I had bars in every window, bars on every door. My mom and dad had a gun. We had a double pincher. And you know what I had at five years old? nightmares every night that I was going to be murdered. I stuttered. I couldn't say five. I talk, 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 talk like, 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 like this. You know why? My neighbor was murdered and bled to death right in front of me. And my other neighbor had a shootout with a burglar. And I kept, I'd have dreams and nightmares. And, and you know what? You know what else was bad when I was a little kid? My dad left when I turned seven and never came back. Kids need a mom and dad. I get so sick of hearing some men say, oh, my kid's got their mom. That's, a, that's, that's good enough. No, it's not good enough. Kids need a mom and dad. And you know what? I think worse than anything else was when I went into first grade. And in the first grade, there I stood every day. They picked teams. And the gym teacher, I still remember her patting me on the back saying, come on, who'll pick John? They picked the boys, they picked the girls, and I got picked last every day. I hated getting picked last. Anybody in here ever been picked last? 
Anybody in here knows what it's like? The people don't want you, you don't measure up like a little ball lost in tall grass and no one can see you? Well, guess what? When I turned nine, I went to church for the first time. And guess what the preacher was preaching on? Anyone who comes to God, he will never turn you away. Whosoever calls on Jesus shall be saved. And that preacher promised me if I made it up there and called on Jesus, that God would pick me. He used the words pick me and put his hand on my life. And he says it doesn't matter what you've done, who you, what you, where you come from. It doesn't matter if you're smart, tall, short. And you know what hit me? God promised he'd pick me. And I got about, I, I walked to the front at nine years old. You know, the first prayer I ever prayed was, J -j 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 Jesus, pick me. And how many of you know it didn't matter to God, my words? How many of you know the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead came to live inside my heart? God wrote my name in, in the Lamb's Book of Life. I became a citizen of a city called heaven. And guess what? That church was like this church. And all these church people got around me, and they put their hands on my shoulders, and they began to pray for me. And they prayed, God, heal his tongue. I went, oh, no, they heard me stutter. And you know what? The Scripture says people out there will laugh and think we're silly. But all I know is I felt the power of God go through me. My tongue was on fire. I felt it tingling like I was chewing on a battery. And all I know is I stuttered every day of my life. I had nightmares every night. But when they prayed over me and those church people called on the power of God, from that moment forward, I never stuttered again. I never had another nightmare. How many of you know the power of God is real? I said the power of God is real. And I'm going to close with this. I didn't do drugs. I didn't get drunk. I grew up in church. I became the second strongest teenager in America. I started both ways in the high school and football team. And every single day I prayed, Lord, use me to reach my high school for you. Every one of you in here should say, every, you should start your day, Lord, here I am. Use me. How many of you think that's the most exciting life in the world? How many know God wants you to bear fruit? He does not want you to go sterile. Come on. Now listen to me. And one day I'm in the weight room and the number one drug dealer comes sneaking through the weight room. And I stepped right in front of him. He smelled like pot. He was flunking out of school. Nobody liked him. But I was nice to him. And he said, okay, I'll go with you to youth group tomorrow night. He, we walked into youth group and my youth group almost fainted. And at the end, he walked forward. And he called on Jesus. And the Bible says, whosoever calls on his name, his spirit comes to live inside them. And I stood behind him to back it up. He turns around, and after he prays, he goes, John Jacobs, will you come pray over my house? The devil lives in my house. I said, what do you mean? He goes, my mother's in the witchcraft and the occult. She does tarot cards and Ouija boards. And every Friday night, we have a seance, and hooded figures appear, and we don't even know who they are. So I said, I, I'm only 17 years old, but I'm going to go pray over his house. But how many of you think people out there who don't know God would think that's silly? People out there who don't know God would, would, would think I'm crazy. But I walked between the bushes. I put my hands on the side of that house two days later. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I claim this family for God. Devil, get out of this house. Let them go in Jesus' name. And one week later, they all come walking into church. They all got saved, and the devil never came back to his house again. How many of you know the power of God is real? I said, the power of God is real. You know what separates us from every other religion? This isn't a religious experience. It's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Hey, my friend's a missionary in India, and they're all friends with all the other missionaries you know, from other religions. And they all have their duties, but when they, have, when they bring a demon-possessed man into the village, the, all the other missionaries go, go get the Christian missionary. You know why? There's only one name the devil fears. There's one name that kicks demons out of a house. There's one name that can set a dope addict free in a second. It's the name of Jesus that rose from the dead that comes to live inside your heart. And tonight, Sean is going to try to snap these chains and then we're going to close in prayer. And I believe this. When he pulls with everything he has, just remember heaven's pulling for you. That's why you're here. Everybody say, come on, Sean. Come on, Sean. 
Everybody say break the chains. Get a big breath. You got to get air in your lungs. You got to pry with your knuckles. Help him. Help him. Help him. Somebody say break the chains. Come on. Break the chains. Break them! Break them! Come on. Come on, help him. One more time. One more time. Come on. Big breath. Get mad. 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 Twist them. Twist them. Twist them. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Real quickly, with everybody's heads bowed, everybody's eyes closed. Please, everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you sure God's with you? Oh, I know you're a good person. I know you've never hurt anybody. But the question is, is do you feel God's presence? Do you, do you know for sure if the lights go out where you'd spend the rest of eternity? There was a man that was dead 17 minutes, and they brought him back with an adrenaline shot to the heart, and he said, when I crossed over the other side, I thought they were my family. All these figures are coming for me. He said, but they had fangs and scales and eyes like snakes, and he said, I realized I was dead, and the wrong ones came for me. This morning, you do not want your heart to stop. And the wrong ones come for you. Because if you're a Christian and you've called on Jesus, the Bible says God send angels to usher you in the presence of God. And he's built you a mansion that will outshine the sun. This morning, wouldn't it be good to be sure? With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, wouldn't it be good to have your sins forgiven? Past, present, and future. Wouldn't it be good to have the God that holds tomorrow fighting, guiding your steps? I'm out of time. I'm going I'm to pray, but, but I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, if you're not sure you're saved, if you're not sure God's with you, you're not sure if the lights went out, you'd make it to heaven in a million years, where would you be? But you want to be sure that when I count to three, if you'd say, Lord, count me in that prayer, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when I count to three. I don't care if you're 80. I don't care if you're eight. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to count to three. And if you want to settle this, you want to make this could be the last chance you ever have. And if you want to make sure God's with you, you want to make sure, you want to make sure that the, the devil showed up to your house, you could kick him out. You want to be sure your name's in the book? Then when I count to three, when I count to three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand as a sign to God, Lord, pick me. Jesus, pick me. Here I am. Save me. If you want to be sure, when I say three, and you're not, but you want to be, raise your hand high. One, two, three. Slip it up high quickly. All over the building. All over. How many others? How many? All over. Any, anybody else? I see all those men's hands, ladies' hands. I see that young person in the back. Anybody else? Slip your hand up high. All right, thank God for all those hands. May put them down. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I announce salvation. I announce eternal life. I announce God's forgiveness. Holy Spirit, draw them to the cross. Jesus, I pray everyone here would be saved. I pray everyone here would have eternal life in a city called heaven. Now I want you to pray with me with your head still bowed and eyes closed. This is for those that raised their hands, but everybody else join in and support them. If you can hear my voice, I want everyone to say, Jesus, 
I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead. And I believe you did it for me. Count that for my sin. I receive eternal life. I receive God's forgiveness. I receive my new beginning. I receive salvation. From this night forward, Jesus, pick me. Come live into my heart. Write my name in the book. And I now have eternal life adopted by God. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart. Jesus Christ is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm going to ask the team, before anyone stands, come stand with me real quick. Pastor, could you come, Pastor, and Pastor, will you come stand? Real quickly, in just one minute, ushers, don't move yet, counselors. If you raised your hand today, not for the church, not for me, but I'm going to ask you to do this as a public profession of your faith in him. In just a moment, I'm going to ask every single person that raised their hand to get up out of their seat, to come down one of these aisles, and come stand with me, facing me. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. I'm going to commission angels to go home with you. But you know why we do this? We do this because the Bible says if you're willing to confess Jesus before others, he'll announce you before the Father and all the angels in heaven. Can I just say this Virginia style? This separates the men from the boys. How many know this is the proof? I said this is the proof right here. So I don't care if you're, I should hold on. Nobody, don't want them to hear this. I don't care if you're five, you're, you're 85. I don't care if you're in the back or in the front. I don't care if you raised your hand this high or you raised your hand this high. If you raised your hand, not for the church, not for us, but with all of heaven on their feet, and the Bible says every angel in heaven shouts over just one of you, just one. Right now, if you raised your hand, would you do this for him? Because if you don't stand in here, we're all just going to share for you how you ever stand out there. Are you ready? From the back to the front. If you raised your hand and you prayed and made a commitment to the Lord Jesus, right now I want you to get up out of your seat and come stand right here, right now. Get up and come. Come on. Come stand right here. Come on, quickly. If you raised your hand in a minute, church, you should be clapping a lot louder than that. Somebody say, thank God. Quickly. Quickly. Come stand here. Come on. Come on. Come on, I'm waiting for you in the back. Church, you should be clapping, shouting. This is a bad morning for the devil in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Come on. Come on. Woo. Woo. Take a, maybe just another step forward. Okay, hold the music. Everybody up here say tonight's not the end. It's only the beginning. God has a great plan for me. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. And there's some people around you that have cards. And all I ask is for one minute for you to put your information on that card. Because this church wants to pray for you from now on. How many know we don't want to just say, see you later, we don't care? How many know this is just the beginning? This church wants to pray for you from now on. We want to see how you're doing a month from now. And this card is so important. Because, because you matter to us. We came all this way just for you. So right after I pray a blessing over you, the counselors are going to hand you a card. Would you take just one minute and just fill it out and give it back to them? But right now, I'm going to pray a blessing. Reach your hands forward and let's pray over these precious people. We pronounce the blessing of God. The curse has been reversed. We pronounce them free in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, raise them up to be your champions on this earth. I commission angels to go home with them. Lord, watch over them. I pray, Father God, save every relative they have. I pray a hedge of protection. I plead the blood in the name of Jesus over them. Heal their scars. Turn them into stars. 
for every setback. Give them a comeback. And Lord, I thank you that they're going to shake this world, world changers and history makers. And we bless them in the name of the Father and Son. In Jesus' name, amen.